Hey, it's Jason with Incredibly Useful Exercises, Volume 9, Upper Fingerboard Mastery, Part 2, I think is the title, quite the title. Uh, let me get this GoPro on the head. I think I actually have all my gear going, so we'll see if uh, everything's working. We just took this little guy out for a run, his first run, and so he's probably going to sleep well. So... It has been a busy phase of life for me these last few weeks, and I'm especially thankful for these incredibly useful exercises because I think that I would just have blown off this technique practice. And in fact, I'm pretty sure I would have if I had it, especially these last few weeks. Um, I go through phases of doing more practicing and less practicing. Um, like we all do, and and when the projects start coming, it's so easy to let this stuff fall off. So having this consistency has been pretty great. Also, uh, just having uh, having it all planned out for you, I, it is so helpful for me um, to have something where I can just pick up the bass and go. It is just around 10 a.m. right now here in San Francisco. And it's funny because 10 a.m. is kind of like the time that musicians start doing things in earnest so often, at least in the orchestral world, which is more my world. That's your standard orchestra rehearsal time. And it's like, you get, get your morning going. You know, I went for that run with our boy over there and did, did some email, kind of planned out the day. And now I'm diving into the bass. And again, uh, thank you for hanging out on these videos. Uh, I will timestamp everything so you can skip through all these exercises. Upper octave, I guess I get the title slightly wrong. Upper octave fingerboard mastery part two. Uh, and just a confirmation, we are recording. We are recording, yay. Okay, so this and part one, it's kind of just like putting a different lens on the same thing, taking a look at some different aspects of the upper octave. By the upper octave, Dennis means this area right here. By the way, just the quick, you've you've heard all this if you've watched these before, but if you're new, this is the rosin I'm digging these days, Leatherwood Bespoke Rosin. I'm using the 30% hydration. Uh, I have 20 to 60% hydration that Andrew Baker, who makes the rosin, sent me. And um, I'm liking this 30%. I, I feel like I should go back up to the 40%. That's a little bit more of the tackiness I'm used to, but I don't know, I'm really digging it. So, and then this is my practicing app Modacity I've got here. This is the volume. These are all available in physical form, also in Kindle form. I'm using the Kindle just so that I don't have uh, 17 volumes or however many volumes at, at my place. And, and then also I, I'm able to do this kind of business if it works. So hopefully it'll work on this video. Okay, at the Modacity, I have everything loaded up in here in a practice list timed out about 34 minutes. It may or may not take that long, we'll see. So tune rosin get set is what I always call my first little thing. Boot up tonal energy tuner, which is a tuner I enjoy. Lots of different modes on here. Let's give my, oh, I should take my practice mute off. Uh, someone asked me uh, today, I actually just answered an email about practice mutes, whether they think it's positive, detrimental, negative. I don't think it's detrimental to my playing. I, I don't know that it's necessarily positive, but I don't think it's negative. And I got in the habit of using one of those back when I was living in small quarters. Of course, now back in small quarters here in San Francisco, but. I don't really need, or it's very sound reinforced. I don't really need it, but I'm in the habit, so. And that's good enough for me. As long as I'm getting a general smile, I'm in good shape. And as with all of these, uh, Modacity has you rate what you do. Uh, not so applicable to rosining, but I'll do it anyway. And now silence. And Dennis recommends two minutes. I, I just feel like I can't su subject you to two minutes of silence. That's a super bizarre. It's bizarre enough to give you 30 seconds of it. Um, also, my over-caffeinated self, it's, it's tough for me to, to even have one minute. Maybe I should work on that. It's funny, though. I, I, have, my I have not had one sip of coffee yet today. Uh, 
So we'll see how, what effect that has on my on, on this session. So next up is centering, which you've seen many times. G, uh, he does it over G. It could be done over anything. I'm going to do it over E today. So I'm just going to do the same scale, just starting low E. So I check in with my feet, my knees, my hips, and I'm just releasing anything at, when I connect with that body part, then I bring my attention to my breath, as many bows as I need, lower back, and kind of go back down the chain to my feet to make sure that everything has some nice flow to it, shoulder blades. Just focus on the breath, always coming back to the breath. Now the neck, which is somewhere, oh boy. Jason, you gotta work on that. <laughs> so much unnoticed tension. Face. Breathe. Right shoulder. Right elbow. Wrist, paying attention to the whole chain, making sure I'm nice and relaxed. Right fingers. Breathe, left shoulder, left elbow, left wrist, left fingers, kind of wiggle them if you're, breathe, body, I realized I went up too far so I'll just go to the fifth for the arms, and then low E and I'll just center. And again, the point isn't what notes you're playing specifically. It's just giving you something to do as you think through these different body parts. You can put the bass down and do this too, and you get a lot of the same benefit. But I do think that there's benefit to actually holding the bass and doing this. I've never actually, until these past, I guess this is the beginning of the third month, doing these incredibly useful exercises, I've never centered like this. I kind of like it because it, it's like centering, but you're in your general playing position. Very cool. Okay, uh, that was okay. Decent bumblebees. Okay. Welcome to a session of things I don't practice a lot and therefore am not in love with my ability to do these. So um, Dennis recommends, which I will probably not do the, well, we'll see. Um, but first time, second time, third time, doing these three times, medium tempo relaxed, little faster, still comfortable, then push the tempo, working up to a light burn in the forearm. Uh, I don't know that I'll do it more than once. And I think that's a great way to do it. But uh, you be, you know, with anything like this, uh, if it's if it's new or like my bass, I have a fairly large seven eighths bass. Um, there's a little more just it's just a little more work <laughs> to get around this. So I'm just really trying to be cognizant of how my whole body is moving and just trying to monitor. And I, I especially I haven't been the most diligent practicer these last couple of weeks. Um, so I I uh, I'm just gonna be careful and gauge what I'm doing. So I'm going to go about this tempo. And so you see this pattern. I've done these before on the channel, but so it's an all chromatic exercise. The fingers are all together. And then it, um, so that's the first bar, what I just did. Uh, then one instead of two. Then, so now it's chromatic of these three. Then thumb goes back a half step. And we're just sort of like inchworming our way back down the bass. When I'm doing three, two, three, I'm, I, I'm not, I don't know if this is good or bad. I think it's good. Um, I'm just letting one kind of hang out. And then for two, two and three really function as a unit for me. So I am engaging two. Um, I think that someone, someone with more biological knowledge, knowledge of biology would be able to tell me, but there's something about the tendons and three uh, with the, I, I don't remember exactly um, pressure, but um, the, the, what I find is I let one kind of hang out. 
and then and always trust but verify Woo! see gotta, gotta check that e is mighty sharp So you can check it in a variety of ways, even low E string, I suppose. So anyway, these exercises then just inchworm their way down the bass. So I'll start one more time. We're here. And you notice there, there are harmonics in all these positions. I'm just sort of checking in. See, B natural. So we got a B and a D. B flat, right? Uh, yes. Yes, jeez, brain. I should have had that coffee. So uh, B flat, C sharp, and that one is B flat B C sharp. I can check B. B's a bit tough to check. It doesn't really work well as a double stop, but B natural, C sharp, good to check. So I have two notes to check. And so maybe I'd want maybe I'd want to practice that. In fact, I would want to practice that. So let's find reestablish that position right there. Checking in with the notes. I'm going to practice this again. It's a little better. Oops. So we're just opening as we keep going down the bass, just like that. Um, I am, uh, I, I, one thing I'm doing, and I do find it helpful for me personally, is just, just so you don't get lost in the black void of, of fingerboard and realize that you've drifted a half step, you're doing yourself no good with that. What I'm doing is I'm taking a slight A little pause at the beginning of every set. Also, I'm just going too darn fast for my fingers this morning. And this is one of those exercises that falls into the category of theoretically, no, it's good. I just never, ever practice this stuff. Um, I, and, and, and one of the nice things about getting into this series is it's making me kind of re-examine exercises that I have done a bit in the past, although honestly, I've never really done this exercise, um, and sort of thinking about the value of those exercises. So this, it's pretty cool. It's a good dexterity exercise, very similar to Max's Magic. It's a great intonational awareness exercise, positioning, verification with harmonics, really good stuff. Um, and then I, I didn't get through much of it uh, here today, but it goes down to the D right here. So... And I'm just making sure that I have a nice, strong arch here in my hand. Whether my finger tip this joint, which I am again forgetting what it's called, this, this first joint, um, whether or not that collapses, in, in my hand with these exercises, it generally doesn't. But as I've gotten older and played more and learned about different techniques, I've come to accept that that's a good technique. I think I thought it was very bad to ever let this joint collapse. Uh, David Allen Moore, who wonderful Los Angeles Philharmonic bass player, he has a video in his Fractal Fingering course, maybe more than one video, uh, on Discover Double Bass, which I will link to somewhere somewhere down or up uh his one and he talks about the kind of essentially what i'm saying only more eloquently than me this joint it's it's cool and depends on context what you're reaching for if you're doing uh double stops or this or that but that this structure is strong is important and so i'm trying to think about this as i go down another thing i'm just noticing again just pointing out if you're newer to this stuff um 
I almost feel like there's like an egg kind of shape right here in my hand. I'm not like this, I'm not like this. I've just got a nice round shape from my player perspective, which hopefully is coming through on the GoPro. Okay, those are good. And again, you could do uh, you could do separate bows. If you're new to these, you could just hang out on the first one. That's a totally good way to do it, thinking about your tone. In these positions, I'm fairly close to the bridge. Again, I have an extended fingerboard, so it's a little bit of an optical illusion, but I am maybe there when I'm in that uh, initial position. Okay, that's a bit on bumblebees. They are going not great, Jason. I guess I was having a better day the other time, but that's okay. There's always tomorrow. Okay, trills, these are very cool. Dennis has lessons out on these, both the even trills and the odd trills, and he's gonna do a much better job of explaining the concept than me. I get it, I just don't, uh Maybe I don't get it if I can't articulate it. <laughs> but uh, regardless, his channel's linked down below, so check out his description of these even trills. Um, metronome is cool. Today I'm not gonna do a metronome. I think I have been on this video, but I'm just gonna... I'm just gonna think about being relaxed and pulling a nice, clear sound. It's gonna be my focus today on these. Oops, I already got the fingering wrong. Dennis uh, recommends doing one, three. So three is gonna be the top notes for these, and that's cool. I wanna try to live in the fingering world laid out for me here, even if ultimately I, I might do something else. And again, sometimes you want to put that metronome, uh, met, can't even talk, metronome on and really be with the groove. What I'm doing here, again, I guess I'm just in that kind of a mood today. I'm sort of slowing down the tempo as I move into the new position just to sort of be aware. It's kind of just like, you know, putting my finger on the record, if you remember what those are, and sort of just like slowing it down, taking a closer look at it. The point of these um, is for clean and clear left-hand articulations. And uh, up high, you're gonna have, uh well, I'll let, I should I should not even get into it. Dennis does this very uh, eloquently and efficiently on his channel, so I'm just going to keep going. Variation um, for this, like down here, I can do this kind of a motion. This is what I was going to try to explain, and then I, I got lost in the description. Um, you can do something very similar. It might look slightly differently, slightly different rather, but I feel. The same muscles being activated up here. So as I'm going to doing these and continue to do these today, I'm going to try to think of it as a forearm uh, rotation that's guiding the fingers. So here's B. And you can hear that slapping, right? I'm assuming you can anyway. Um, and that's the mark for me at this tempo of doing the exercise the way I want to be doing it. Oops, crappers. which are a bit easier to do than odd trills. I've definitely found that to be the case. So C, so that was uh, sixes. Now we're doing eights. Bottom, bada 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 bottom, bada 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 bottom. Here's C. the cleanest that I could have done at the end, but I'm gonna move on just for these purposes here so we can get into odd trills. Um, 
And again, just watch Dennis's description for exactly how these groupings work. But what you'll discover is now you're gonna be doing, you're gonna get triplets, quintuplets, and septuplets, which are just a little more um, uh, funky. <laughs> so here's the kind of the prep exercise, the, the initial one. Same rule or same uh, principle applies. I'm trying to get that clickage in the left hand. So here's variation A. Like da 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 da. Centering, which I've again neglected to do through most of these, is kind of coming back up, especially for me standing and playing on this slightly larger bass. It's uh, for these upper octave, upper position uh, focused days. I really want to think about lengthening, <sighs> taking a nice centered breath. Okay, so now we're getting into variation B. So we've got quintuplets. Bum, bum, ba, 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 bum, bum. Uh, my conductor back at Northwestern University in the 90s, uh, he, I think he might even still be there, Victor Jampolsky, principal second violin in the Boston Symphony, wonderful conductor. He, to, he told, he would always say you can't really think above groups of four. So he would always tell people to divide fives into three and two or two and three. So I still, to this day, whether or not that's true, I, I have internalized that and over the decades. So I always think one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, or what, I can't say it, but ba da ba 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 da 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 triple a duple or something like that. I think that might kind of make it uneven, but that's the way my brain works as we're, uh, as I'm doing this. So it's like, uh, and so then C, I'm just kind of, kind of fast forwarding verbally here. So, so I, I find this challenging to count. This is the one where I definitely, and Dennis mentions that in the description, the, the odd trolls take a lot of concentration to master. Uh, persist through the learning curve. I have been persisting. I've actually been able to do this relatively okay with the metronome, although I'm not gonna try to show off on that <laughs> today. Uh, this is Monday morning. Um, the way I think of this is four and three. So I think I'll... So I think one, two, one, and one, two, three, four, one, two, three. Or one, and one, and two, and one, and a... Actually, I th actually no. I, I take it back. I do the first one. One and one, two, three, four. One, two, three. Bum, bum, ba da ba da ba da ba bum, bum. So that's just the way I group sevens um, and also fives. So that was okay. Uh, these star ratings, by the way, if I'm honest, they do rise throughout the week. I've been recording these videos early in the week. Not trying to make excuses, but just so I've been discovering. Now this one I find just psychologically challenging um, because. Resist the urge to stop if the notes aren't perfectly in tune. As you can tell from everything I've done here today, it's hard for me to resist that urge. I'm going to try to resist the urge. Uh, there's one typo in here. I think it's really, it's not a big deal. It's just, uh, and I might be wrong, but I think, I think I'm right. Um, this right here, uh, so I'm just going to point it out. So if you're not, if you're wondering as you're looking. So we open up and we go to the high D. This section is one, three, so it's a whole step in one, three, and you're slowly opening the hand and then you get to C, D, and then you close it back down. But I think it should be B, C sharp here um, because the rest of them are chromatics. Uh, but I could be wrong on that too because I've looked at a few of these and then realized. So I'm gonna throw in that extra thing. So again, I'm going to throw in not that you're necessarily following along with these, but if you are, um, the pay, the print versions, uh, here I'm going to be doing G, B, C sharp. Like a, I'm adding in a bar right there. Okay, so this starts like this. That was relatively okay. I mean, I, I did not like my tone or my accuracy, but I, I got to D, so that, that was cool. I'll do that one more time. Um, and again, we're just trying to work on 
making this a comfortable motion, I guess. Again, Dennis will explain it more eloquently than that right here. Um, but we're just working, yeah, quick and accurate hand extension contraction fourth position. That's what we're doing. So, um, <coughs> you know, just focusing on the point of the exercise. So this is one where I'm not, even though my, my instinct is to do exactly this, my, I'm not trying to go. And tune each one like I've done with all these others. I'm just gonna let it rip. Okay, Jason, ignore your instincts. Let's go. <gasps> so again, and again, I'm deeply not liking. <laughs> The way I'm doing it, but I'm not going to edit. Uh, that's okay. This is the learning process. Persist through the learning process. So, so, so then this next part right here, um, we were doing one, two. So again, opening and closing this and keeping this a half step. Now we are also going to open and close this, but we're going to do whole step one, three throughout the pattern. So starting right here, G, A flat, B flat, and we're just going to open and close just like we did before. Again, not, not my finest hour, but um, this is a good example of, I can always verify by going down there, by the way. This is a good example. If you watch my first finger, I, this is something that was very difficult for me to uh, break the habit of always wanting to be curved no matter what. You'll notice that my first finger, though, uh, just because this is a little bit of an extended technique, it kind of is an extended technique, um, I am letting this first joint buckle, which uh, seems to work better with my hand. I'll do it one more time. So I'll get, get down here so you can see. And I could keep it uh, uh, not, I could keep it curved for the first couple, but as I get further, uh, if I keep it curved, I, I it becomes very challenging to get that third figure around. So uh, maybe I'll keep it curved the first couple. <laughs> in microtones here, so let's try that again. So again, things I should do that I don't do, and now I feel guilty, but I, I like them. And again, that's sort of the nice thing about um, putting different lenses on similar aspects of your technique like this. Uh, there's stuff I need this for, and I and it's it's building it up in a little bit more of an abstract technique way. It's like going to the gym and working on some muscle groups that you don't want to work on, but then you don't sprain something when you're playing. Whatever this analogy is, is I'm going to escape this analogy now. <laughs> okay, and now this last part is uh, using thumb one, two, three, doing different diatonic patterns. So the first one is uh, is just running up and down the G A B C, and I really do enjoy this one. This is a very it's like turning, you know, going in this sort of curvy, curvy uh, path. And then does that, uh, I believe it does that two bars every time, right? Yeah, so first one, we'll just say it's G major. Again. Now G minor. So. And now again, back to G major. I really like that last little bit. Um, not that I need to like or not like any of them. They're, they're all good for me, but um, 
But I mean, this is the sort of stuff that I, in my own practice over the years, typically tend to practice for dexterity. Um, this I don't, but I'm noticing all these times when, th when just being comfortable opening and closing right here is extremely useful. So anyway, it's a good exercise. I am working on it, but it is a work in progress. This might be the lowest rating I've given. Uh, and Siri thinks I want it to do something, which I don't. Okay, uh, sixth, this is super cool. This is the first time I've done this in this series. I'm not sure if Dennis has shot a video for this yet or released a video, although I'm sure he, he's doing one for every one of these. So um, like these other double stop exercises, all of them are great, all of them are a little bit different. Play this pizzicato and strum the notes with your thumb is the advice. So here is the exercise and I'll do just that. I'll put the bow down and we will go thumb. So you can go like, I kind of like to do that. Pluck the low, pluck the high, strum. And I'm always pretty much without exception when I'm practicing double stops, I'm always focused on locking in the lower note and building the upper note off of that. So I want the foundation solid and then this is the variable. That otherwise if they're both are shifting, you're just it's it's it might not work so well. <laughs> so again, B G and I already got it a little bit off. So that's why what I did the first time. I'll check a harmonic when there is one just to make sure. Then we go up. So now I got And I can check. And I'm really trying to listen to the sounds of these minor thirds or minor sixths, sorry, minor sixth, major sixths. And going up, we got another one. And then, and as you're going up, this goes up to the, to the, you know, it goes all the way up to this high G, which is great. Um, Dennis says, and Max Dimoff, principal bass of the Cleveland Orchestra, great, great player uh, and teacher, plays these without the double stops and beats three and four. So what you can do is just isolate this. And then, and that's a really good, that's a really good sort of, uh, not even a beginner move, it's just a different way of practicing these. Uh, I find that super cool. So then the idea is go up to the high G, come back down, and then do the same thing on the D and the A strings. Uh, Pizzicato reveals a lot of different things, just like the bow reveals a lot of things that Pizzicato can, it can be a little more uh, obscure intonation, this sort of thing. Pizzicato for the primarily arco player, Pizzicato reveals how well you got the notes stopped, how clean your closes are on the notes. It's something a jazz player might not think about as much because, or they might do more naturally because they're generally playing pizzicato. Um, the bow, of course, is like a pitch magnifying glass and there's many other things, but so I do think it's great to practice them both ways. <laughs> There are harmonics there. They don't sound um, that consonant when you play them, but they're, they are there if you want a reference. Um, and you can do, the, the slurs are great. So you can go. And I'm not in love with that intonation. I might even place it. I'm going sharp a little bit. And now this is one of those that I'm feeling this muscle. I'm feeling even like a little bit of burn with that limited amount. Um, so if you feel that, don't uh, don't uh, you want to don't want to strain yourself. You want to increase your abilities, but you don't want to cause injury. I think that's the, 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 we we probably are all in agreement with that. So just just take your time with these. Feel free to do like what Max said to just do. Feel free. I find it helpful to do this G harmonic first and then. You'll notice my first finger, I am, I can keep it on the G string. 
I find is a little more comfortable for me, and there are varying schools of thought on this for sure, is I keep two and three together and I let one just sort of hang out. I don't want it to be like this or pointing out in some sort of way indicating tension. But if I put it here, I actually feel like I've got a little more tension in my hand than if I just let it hang out uh, kind of over the D string. And now we're getting to the point, I'll catch up in the music. Now we're getting to the point where Dennis has third finger still indicated. The D is the point where I kind of say bye to the third finger a lot of the time, but depending on double stops, sometimes like this is, if you play the Kusevitsky concerto, you're gonna be doing this fingering most likely at this point. So it is a good thing to work on in your uh, fingering arsenal. So we were here. So if I am continuing with three, I'm just gonna keep second finger there. There's one where I, even if, even though Dennis has three marked, I feel like that's starting to get to be a little bit, like just a little bit cramped in my hand. So I might just finish those two off uh, with, with two. And I think he has the last one marked with two. So I just might do that. Maybe, maybe not, uh, that F sharp with two. Okay, well those obviously need work. Um, and I, th th I am thinking of all sorts of applications in Bach and other music. Um, they're great. They're definitely more taxing when you do them on the D and the A string. So you can hang out with these. Uh, same advice applies to anyone who's kind of kind of new to this area of the bass. I would take less and really focus on doing it well. I think it's almost always the best option. Now, uh, that was okay. Vomits, which I believe is the last exercise here. Yeah. Um, so we're doing vomits in the upper position, uh, upper octave. We're going to go from B flat to B flat. I think this is a really a good thing to do with a drone. So you can put a F drone on. You can do it with vibrato, you can do it without vibrato. There are all the same fingering combinations. Let me turn this off for a second though, because um, Dennis has arrive on four and start on four. And I generally don't do that in this upper octave. He may have just taken the description. Uh, this may just be the general vomits description, not specifically for the upper octave, but for me, and, and he may very well do four up here. I just, with my hand, I just don't have a lot of use cases for four and uh, it saves me time. <laughs> Only practicing one, two, three. And I just don't, I just have, I, I've never used four uh, really for anything except maybe a harmonic or an emergency a pie. I'm gonna, we got a little bit of humidity here in San Francisco today, so I'm gonna try to make my life a little easier. That guitar, there's this guitar fretboard stuff that works really well if you want to get if you want to get that sort of tackiness off of your finger. I cannot, for the life of me, remember. My friend Andres Martin uses it, uh, and it's it's really cool for just kind of getting things moving uh, when you're playing solo stuff. So, because uh, even now there's like a little my finger kind of there's there's some friction that I'm it's not it'll be fine. Okay. So B flat, I always check there. And I'm gonna do one, one. So one for the low note, one for the high note. I'm not gonna do any vibrato and I'm not going to use a metronome, although there is a metronome mark, I'm just gonna take it, take it nice and easy. I'm using harmonics, if they're there, just for right now. That was always a tough one, that fourth, because it's a whole step away. So that one, but you learn to hear that. If it's funky like it is right now, I'm just gonna repeat it. Good, now 
I might vary it up. So maybe I'll do the next one, or I will do the next one. I'll do the one, two. And I, I'm so used to playing these in A major, you know, it's every time I'm flat when I land on it. So just get that in my head. So I'm going to go one, two. But I'm going to do a little vibrato this time. I'm not going to... I'm not going to belt. I'm just going to do... Although I could, that's valuable too. Just for right now, I'm practicing a different way, a different tone color. noticing a, a habit that I'd like to break that's been with me for decades. I, if I focus on it, I get better, but I definitely am one of those people that's like, I sit on it and then I warm it up. Rather than... Keeping my vibrato more consistent, I uh, like consistently throughout. When I record myself back and I focus on a little bit more consistency throughout. I like the way it sounds, so I think it's just a bad habit of mine. I saw that creeping in as I was doing that one, and so I was trying to uh, think about it. They're really good. Uh, drones, I think, are super valuable. You can change up the octave, too. Drop it down if that upper octave starts to drive you crazy. It definitely does for me. And then I would do one, three, which is not really a shift, you know, for the first notes. Um, one thing, and I think I first picked this up probably many places, but I definitely remember Mark Morton, uh, his approach to fingering. He wrote this really cool book in the early 90s, I believe it was early 90s, about bass technique. And he really l differentiated technical playing from lyrical playing. And so technical playing would be an example of that, like a... a like I'm typing fast. And so my fingers are staying over notes and I'm keeping this diatonic on a hand position or whatever the hand position is. For this, which is very much lyrical playing, my fingers, um, unless there's some reason for them not to be, these three fingers are generally fairly close together. Thumb, and there are so many different ways to do this. My thumb, I still keep my thumb about a whole step away from my first finger. I definitely learned, uh, I, I had, I definitely uh, spent a lot of my life playing with the thumb right next to, which I think might actually get a better sound. Maybe I should do that again. I just found that this was a little bit more um, uh, flexible in terms of going between things that move quickly and things that are a little more mel melodic. So I like that concept. Mark Morton, who incidentally does these great Beatles uh, covers, that's kind of his bi been his big thing. I'll try to link up to that somewhere since I'm talking about him. Uh, shout out to Mark. Uh, I, I do like thinking about practicing that way. So when I'm thinking lyrically, I'm not worrying too much about maintaining any sort of particular a hand shape, although I do try to just maintain a general uh, good kind of like holding a, a tennis ball curve. So vomits are great. This is again, uh, I'm glad I'm putting this series out, <laughs> even though it like it warts and all, I definitely have not practiced any of this stuff we're doing here nearly as much as I probably should have, although who's say what I should or shouldn't be practicing, but I do notice that um, these are kind of weak when I come back to them, like I've been coming back to them these last few weeks. And as I do them, then when I practice my solo music, which I'm going to do later today, it feels better. So kind of a no brainer. It's probably helping. Okay. We're going to wrap up with just a little bit of the good old silence.
Wow, so that is volume nine of 16. We are on the downward slope <laughs> of this. So uh, I hope you have been enjoying uh, following along with me on these. It's been fun to put these together. Just getting everything turned off here. Um, so I don't have like a three hour long uh, iPhone. <laughs> Uh, video of Modacity. So that's volume nine, volume 10 through 16 are coming. I'm trying to do one of these a week, have been doing one of these a week. I don't know if I'll keep doing these GoPro videos on my head after this series is done. I think there's a lot that I can show using more traditional camera angles too, but we'll just see lots of cool things coming up in store. So thank you for watching this. Thank you if you made it all the way to the end here. That's very cool. I guess I might as well just say hit that like button, hit the subscribe button, all those things that people say, and we will see you in the next video. Video, and he does not need a walk, but maybe later.